If you like listening to Warriors in Their Own Words, check out our other show, the Medal of Honor podcast. The link is in the show description. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Captain Max Cleland, later Senator Cleland, lost both of his legs and an arm from a grenade explosion while serving in Vietnam. In this interview, Cleland describes the explosion and the crucial role that medics played in saving his life. I uh, felt that Vietnam was the war of my generation that I could not avoid, and I didn't want to avoid it. I was in uniform. I was a young lieutenant. I was on active duty as a young ROTC uh, graduate, and uh, it was the mid-60s. And uh, by 1967, I volunteered for Vietnam and went with the uh, 1st Air Cavalry Division. <clears throat> the 1st Air Cavalry Division was later committed uh, after the Tet Offensive in early 1968 to relieve the siege of Quezon. So I went with that uh, relief unit with the 1st Cav uh, surrounding the hills uh, near Quezon. On one mission, I was a communications officer for an infantry battalion at the time. And uh, I went to, to unload my radio team on a hill. Uh, so we could set up a radio relay into Quezon for the battalion moving into Quezon, breaking the siege there that week. Uh, I got off a helicopter, ducked under the helicopter blades, had my flank vest on, my steel pot, some grenades on my web gear, had my M16 in my left hand, turned around, looked at the helicopter, it took off, looked down, there was a grenade. Now, I didn't anticipate <laughs> that it was an enemy grenade or that it was live because grenades had fallen off my web gear a lot. You know, you're moving around, you're jumping around, you're in and out of bunker and dodging rockets and whatever. And so life was pretty confusing. And so I thought it was mine. I thought it dropped off my web gear. And I still think probably it did. But uh, I had my M16 in my left hand. I reached in with my right hand to get it. I must have been about five or six inches from it when it went off. Uh, technically, I should be dead because the killing radius of a grenade is about five yards or five meters uh, you were in that, you're dead. Well, my flank vest vest helped save me. Uh, my steel pot was blown off, and my left hand was saved because it was behind me holding my M16. But my right arm was blown off instantly. My right leg was blown off instantly. And my left leg was so badly mangled, it was uh, amputated within the hour. So there I am laying on the ground, my windpipe shattered, can't speak, can't talk. And I'm laying on the ground, bleeding and dying. I was totally stunned by the grenade explosion. It was deafening. It threw me back. And and then I, I was just absolutely felt like I was burning all over. Uh, later, I found out it was the flash burn from the grenade that seared some of the wounds. Uh, is the reason I didn't die on the spot right there in a few minutes. But I, I lay there bleeding and dying and, and calling out for help. And, and uh, it was a powerful sense of helplessness. Well, unbeknownst to me, a team of four Navy medical corpsmen attached to the Marine Corps were right there on that hill. I mean, Providence, good Lord, was looking after me. There's four medics, not just one, but four right there on that hill. They rushed to me, and I can remember when they started cutting off my uniform. I thought, you know, in the military, uniform is sacrosanct. And I thought, here I am missing almost two legs and, and my right arm, and I'm bleeding and dying. And I'm thinking, God, don't cut off my uniform. <laughs> but they knew what they were doing. So they started cutting off my uniform, making an immediate tourniquet to stop the bleeding. And they called in an immediate uh, dust off or helicopter, a Huey, that was, uh, in effect, uh, the lifeline. But while I was laying there, they took care of me and uh, made sure I got on the medevac helicopter which uh, got me to the Division 8 station. There, other medics took over, had an IV put in in the chopper on the way to the bunker, and uh, one shot of morphine, uh, 
And uh, they started asking me my name, rank, and service number. And I thought, you got to be kidding me, man. You know, I guess it was to, you know, make sure we get, we tag, tag this body properly, you know. <laughs> and so uh, I looked up at one medic and I said, you think I'm going to make it? And he said, you just might, you know. <laughs> I figured under the circumstances, it was pretty much a word of encouragement. So, so uh, I was put on a helicopter again, flown to a, a Quonset hut on the South China Sea. Uh, all this done within an hour. And uh, my life was saved by a team of uh, five physicians. But it was the medics that got to me first. And the medics in the helicopter that got the IV in. And it was the medics in the bunker in the division aid station that I think ultimately saved my life. And the reason I'm here talking to you today. I mean, any military person who has ever been wounded or shocked or gone through trauma or whatever and had to call for a medic or call for help and is attended by a medic, boy, I'll tell you, uh, you never forget that. And you never forget those young men who saved my life. The tragedy is I never knew their names. They went on to other situations in the war. And uh, looking back, God knows, I, I really owe my life to him. Looking back, I didn't know that they were medics at the time. I didn't know they were Navy corpsmen, trained medics, four of them attached to the Marine Corps at the time. It happened to be on that hill when I was on it. I mean, again, Providence, I think, intervened in my life and saved my life right there on the battlefield through the lives of four medics and their skill to respond instantly to a life-threatening situation for a soldier. And later, I look back, you know, what are the odds that four trained corpsmen, medics, are going to be right there with you when you have, uh, I don't know, three limbs basically blown off and are bleeding and dying on the ground? What are the odds? Pretty remote. But that's what medics do. They get there and they... Stop the bleeding. They, they get the IV in. They stabilize you as best you can. They talk to you. They encourage you and they get you as soon as humanly possible to further aid uh, and ultimately surgery. And they did that all within the hour. In Vietnam, the statistics were that if you were wounded and were able to receive medics and medical attention within the hour and didn't have a head injury, you stood a 98% chance of survival. But what that did was complicate life back in the States because what happened was we had 10,000 amputees out of the Vietnam War. More arms, legs, and eyes were lost in the Vietnam War than in World War I and Korea combined. So you save life on the battlefield through incredible, miraculous medics uh, and their training, and that just complicates the rehabilitation process back here. But at least your life is saved on the battlefield, and I consider that, and in my case, uh, certainly a miracle. And I didn't have a sense that I was literally drifting out of life, that life was oozing away from me. And I had this sense, powerful sense, that if I slipped into unconsciousness, I would never regain it. I'd never come back. You know, I'm out of here. <laughs> I know I'm leaving here. <laughs> and uh, if if I if I lose consciousness, I ain't making it back. I mean, I just I just had that powerful knowing, you know, in an instant almost. And so I fought to stay conscious. And their voices, their shouting, their 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 activity, you know, kept me in it, kept me conscious. Now, a fascinating thing about that is that's part of medical training, the training of medics. I was just earlier this year in Schweinfurt, Germany, where I, uh, ironically, uh, the, it was 30 years to the day I was wounded in Vietnam, April 8th, 68, uh, April 8th, 98. And it was the first time I'd been in an army helicopter since I was in there with a medic putting an IV in my arm, you know, blown away 30 years ago. I went down to see in Schweinfurt, Germany, uh, training of army medics. And I went, I saw their training and it was very realistic. And I noticed how they're trained to talk to, uh, in effect, their, their patients. You know, you know, stay with me. Don't lose it. I'm here. You know, uh, that's, that's part of it to keep the patient conscious. Cause I, I knew if I'd lost consciousness, I, I was gone. It's amazing what flashes of insight you get when, when you lay there dying, you know. Uh, one of the flashes of insight that I got was, 
how easy it was to, to potentially drift off into nothingness or drift off into the dark or, or just let the black overwhelm you and just let life ooze away. And that I guess maybe since that moment, life has been uh, a lot of effort. It took, you know, the medics talking, encouraging me, talking to each other, doing things, trying to put, you know, save my life, help me fight to stay in the game. Uh, there have been other people along the way, uh, in Vietnam, in the hospitals in Japan, in Walter Reed, in the VA system, who helped m encourage me when my, I was down, when I felt my life was oozing away in one form or the other, mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, helped me get uh, strong at the broken places. That's the great line by Ernest Hemingway, who himself got wounded in World War I, almost became a single-leg amputee. And 10 years after his war, wrote a book called uh, A Farewell to Arms. In there, he's got a great line. He said, the world breaks us all, but after it, many are strong at the broken places. For me, uh, the war in Vietnam broke me, almost killed me, but medics helped me get strong at the broken places. Welcome to Anthology of Heroes, the podcast that explores the most pivotal moments of history through the eyes of those who lived it. In this podcast, we don't spend our time recounting facts and dates. Instead, we follow in the footsteps of national heroes, kings, or ordinary people who lived and breathed the moments that shaped our world. We're not hemmed in by eras, borders, or religions. Instead, we seek out the tales of those who defied the odds and fought passionately for their beliefs. Whether they're right or wrong is up to you to decide. From Vercingetorix's doomed rebellion against Rome, to Osceola's unshakable war against the USA, all the way up to the inspiring Sobibor concentration camp uprising in World War II, each episode is an immersive listening experience, blending music and sound effects to really draw you into the story. Our episodes go for about 45 minutes, making them perfect for your commute, and are crafted using a wealth of historical sources, which I list on our website if you want to learn more. I'm the host, Elliot Gates, and I'm thrilled to have you joining me as we uncover history's hidden gems and illuminate the faded pages of our past. Look out for the Anthology of Heroes podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere else you get your podcasts from. History is the greatest adventure story. But does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast, and the answer is that some women were seizing power, or escaping slavery, or spying for their country, or creating artistic masterpieces, while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married, and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. When you were acknowledged as a medic, it was much like you being acknowledged as a young lieutenant in the assault or a young radio telephone operator. You know, uh, the snipers pick the, pick the RTO, the, the, the first, uh, and, and the, and the person on each side of them, because one of them must be a leader. They also pick off the, 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 uh, the squad leader or the team leader, the point person. But the guy, uh, who is obviously the medic is the guy who can help save some lives and they go after him too. And also, uh, you know, uh, when that, uh, Red Cross was painted on the side of a dust off, those dust off pilots were the most courageous pilots in Vietnam because they braved everything to get there and save a life. And, uh, so the medics and the dust off pilots saved my life. And that's how I wound up to be a United States Senator. I would never made it here without them. In Georgia, we have a wonderful story of a guy named Desmond Doss who comes out of World War II. And, um, he went in World War II as a very religious person, very mild-mannered, quiet, religious person, went in as a conscientious objector, but joined the Marine Corps, became a medic, and went to the Pacific and on uh, Iwo Jima, uh, saved the life, uh, lives of over 30 men there in a pure hellacious situation, and uh, won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Here's a medic, but a medic conscientious objector. He committed his life not to taking life, but saving it and risked his life for the lives of his fellow men. Wow. 
that's that's uh, really what a medic is all about. I think it is a special breed. I think they have to have a special commitment uh, to people and to life and to life saving because, in effect, they're not under arms, so to speak. Soldiers are pretty much armed to the teeth. I was when I got wounded, man. I had about everything you could carry. <laughs> You know, M16, 45, knife, everything, you know, uh, grenades. But <clears throat> medics are there to not take life, but save it. And actually, every time they do their job, they put themselves at risk. Every time. When they go to that wounded soldier, sailor, airman, Marine corpsman, whatever, uh, whenever they do that, they put themselves at risk. They put themselves in harm's way as well, but they're there to save a life and not take it. I think uh, military medicine continues to work miracles on the battlefield, whether it's uh, Vietnam or Persian Gulf War. Uh, military medicine on the battlefield uh, works miracles, but you can't work miracles without miracle workers. And that's what uh, I think... Uh, our medics, our medical corpsmen, corpsmen and women, our nurses, our doctors that are engaged in battlefield medicine, I think that's what they're all about. And without them, we couldn't have an army. We couldn't have uh, an Air Force. We couldn't have a Navy. We couldn't have a Marine Corps. We couldn't have a defense structure that protects the country. When I was Secretary of State in Georgia, Part of my responsibility as Secretary of State was to uh, put the Confederate battle flags uh, on display there in the state capitol. And I began getting a little interested in my own personal history. I found out, amazingly enough, just a few years ago, that I'm the great-grandson of a Confederate war veteran. Not just a Confederate war veteran, but a Confederate war veteran who served under Robert E. Lee outside of Richmond. And in, on July 13th, 1864, in the Battle of the Crater near Petersburg, became a single-arm amputee on the right side. He lost his right arm. So my great-grandfather fought in the Civil War and lost and became an amputee. But he was medevaced to the big Confederate casualty hospital in Richmond, and then later discharged uh, near my little hometown outside of Atlanta. But because of radical reconstruction, uh, he didn't get any veterans' benefits, no health care, nothing. But after about 10 or 12 years, um, my grand great-grandfather applied to the state of Georgia for an artificial arm in 1889. In other words, that was the only benefit pretty much out there if you're an amputee, apply for an artificial arm or, or leg. The amazing thing about it is when I saw the great documentary by Ken Burns on the Civil War, there was one fact that stood out from this brutal war and all this horror of the Civil War, and that was that at the end of the war, for the state of Mississippi, one-fifth of its budget went to artificial limbs for Confederate veterans. One-fifth of the entire state budget of the state of Mississippi after the Civil War went for artificial limbs for veterans of the Civil War. Isn't that amazing? So uh, uh, I, I will say, too, that the rounds, the caliber of the rounds in the Civil War was such that if you got hit in a, a limb, you were pretty much subject to amputation because it tore it and tore the bone and the ligament so severely because the caliber was so large that it, if it didn't rip the limb off, it was later amputated. And of course, in many hospitals, they ran out of chloroform and so forth. I mean, uh, it's, you got a great scene in Gone with the Wind, you know, when Dr. Mead operating in a hospital in Atlanta, you know, he ran out of chloroform. I mean, so war produces terrible tragedy. If you don't uh, believe it, just see Saving Private Ryan and also see the powerful role that medics play uh, and have played 
But I, I, it's, it's fascinating to find out that I'm a descendant of a war veteran who also became an amputee and that after the Civil War, the state of Mississippi had to devote such a powerful portion of its budget to just taking care of amputees. And that was repeated uh, in, in virtually in, in, in every state or in, in America after the war. I will say to you, I, after going to Gettysburg, that uh, if you survived a wound, you were just lucky because they really didn't have the kind of medics we normally think about. And they left their dead and dying on the battlefield and retired from the battlefield. And the citizens of the hometown and friends and relatives had to come and nurse them. Now, there's a powerful story out of the Battle of Gettysburg, and it pertains to a General John B. Gordon, who at that time was a Brigadier General at Gettysburg. He was in the advance on day one at Gettysburg and came across a Union major lying supine on the battlefield, got down off his horse, offered the major, his opponent, aid and comfort. Said The major said, my wife is a nurse. She's in town, and if you get the word to her, she'll come and help me. That night, Gordon got the word through the lines to the, to the wife. She came and, in effect, saved the major's life. Years later, then U.S. Senator John B. Gordon from Georgia encounters the major in, a, in New York and says, I knew a man who died at Gettysburg with your name. He said, I am that man, sir. And said, I knew a General Gordon who saved my life. And he said, I am that man, sir. But the powerful lesson there is that during the Civil War, you didn't have medics running around taking care of people. If you got wounded, you lay there, bled and died, or else somebody from the town or a family member came and, and, and hauled you off the battlefield. So thank God we've come a long way. The ending of Private Ryan hit me personally, and I think it should affect us all. And <clears throat> at the end, the protagonist, played by Tom Hanks, basically whispers in the ear of the Private Ryan, whose life has been saved in this case, and basically says, as I understand it, whispers in his ear, said, earn it. And... At the end of the movie, there's Private Ryan, obviously 50-some-odd years older, at the gravesite of the man who helped save his life. Among the gravestones of those who helped save Western Europe and win World War II. And he turns to his wife and says, you know, have I lived a good life? Have I been a good person? In other words, reinforce me. Tell me I've earned it. You know, and I think uh, I think that's one of the things that weighs on my mind. You can't go through what I've been through, and in effect, have your life saved by medics and by providence, the hand of providence, and come back and not want to do something meaningful with it. And I got into politics in terms of further public service and. Fortunate to be here in the Senate. And I think about my obligation every day. And can I answer that question? Have I earned it? The medics gave me a chance to earn it. And I feel like I have to earn that every day. That was Captain Max Cleveland. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcast.com. We're always looking to improve the show. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rule Hoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers, Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words.
This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a $100 bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having a lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts. 